Good morning. We uh, welcome every, every one of us this morning. Uh, those that are downstairs, uh, uh, we're going to get started. If you can walk upstairs, you're more than welcome to come up and join us. And those that can't, well, praise the Lord, you enjoy the service down below. And uh, we just welcome you this morning in, in, in uh, the love of Jesus Christ. We were blessed this morning. We, uh, Brother Daniel gave us a, a really good message. And I pray that uh, I was blessed by it, and I'm sure a lot of us were. And uh, I'm still, uh, I'm trying to use, find a word, but I can't find it. I'll use the best that I know how, but I'm still uh, eating from that uh, touch my heart where Brother Daniel touched about the stone being rolled away. And whatever that stone is in your lives, might be sin, might be whatever, God is greater than the stone. The ladies were looking up, trying to figure out who's going to roll the stone away, but Christ rolled it away. And we have someone greater in here today. And I was really rejoicing, rejoicing because Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And because he has risen, we have life, eternal life. And I was blessed this morning. I'm sure we're going to be blessed with what Pastor Mike has for us this morning. So uh, if you're downstairs, why don't we just stand up and uh, we're going to stand and we're going to open in prayer. And again, if you, you're able to come upstairs, we welcome. There's much room up here, and uh, we're going to get started. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for your servants that take time to study your Word and to give us the Word of God. Even Pastor Mike, this morning, Lord, we pray for him, Father, as uh, <clears throat> he has the confidence in you, Lord, not in ourselves, but in you, Lord, to deliver what you have put in his heart for every one of us. So, Father, I pray that you bless the families downstairs. Bless them, Lord. And thank you for Sister Frances being here with us this morning, Lord. Bless her, Lord. Sister Victoria, Lord, also bless Sister Vicky, Lord. And others, Father God, that came to visit and are visiting this morning, Lord. Father, also bless those that are at home, Lord that could not come out, Lord, bless them. Extend your hand of mercy to them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Whatever they're going through, Lord, whatever stone is in their midst, Father God, by the power of God, the risen Christ, remove it, Father. Remove it, Lord. You said this mountain shall be removed, not by my, not by spirit, but by my, by my spirit, says the Lord. So, Father, have your way this morning. Have your way, Father. Speak to our lives. Father, anoint the worship. Anoint the message. And we'll put all things under this roof in your hands, O oh God. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? Amazing grace This is a family 
的佛。
sing in the middle of the storm and louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar and up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive I'm gonna sing in the middle of Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. The man's empty praise, the treasures that fade are never enough. But then you came along and put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. It's the God of the doubt, it's the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. And there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. And nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. For ashes, you turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is.
Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just, we sing and we proclaim, Lord, praise and honor unto thee. Lord, you have risen from the grave, and we just give you thanks and praise just for redeeming us, for purchasing us, for for bearing all our sin, Lord, for making a way to the Father. And we just give you honor, praise, and thanks this morning. Just pray you have your way with this meeting in your awesome and holy name. We all pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and greet those around you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Good morning, family of God. Praise the Lord. And it is a good morning. You know what? Every morning is a good morning. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> As uh, Brother Louis mentioned when he opened, we had a, a blessed sunrise service this morning, and our thank you to Brother Daniel for for the word that uh, God put in his heart. Praise God. We were we were truly blessed. Um, uh, no announcements, uh, but I have uh, a prayer request, and that is uh, for Sister Sheila. She has a cousin, and uh, this cousin's wife, uh, her name is Irene, and Irene has cancer, and uh, for a time, uh, this cancer had been in remission, but uh, that cancer has come back, and uh, Irene has decided uh, not to uh, undergo any treatments. So uh, Sister Sheila asked if we would just uh, lift up her cousin Irene in prayer, and let's do that right now. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning, Lord. Father, knowing, Lord, that you are a, a merciful God, Lord, a a, a loving God, Lord, a compassionate God, Lord. And Father, this morning, Lord, we just lift up, Lord, Sister Sheila's uh, cousin, uh, Irene, Lord. And Father, you know the circumstance, Lord, even as I explained. So, Father, we just put her in your hands, Lord Jesus. We ask that your will be done. Lord, our prayer, Lord, is that, Lord, she would be uh, healed, Lord, from uh, this affliction. But, Lord, you know all things. And so, Lord, we just put her in your hands. We submit to your will. And we just thank you, Lord, even that we can come to you, Lord, seeking your face, asking this of you, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So at this time, then, I'm going to, yes, Brother Regis. Women's Bible study on Tuesday. Women's Bible study on Tuesday, so 6 o'clock here. Ladies, Women's Bible study, 6 o'clock Tuesday. Um, apart from that, then I'm going to dismiss the young people to their class and call Pastor Mike forward. Pastor Mike. Praise God. The Lord is good. Amen. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, if today you're you're visiting with us for the first time or for the first time this month. There's uh, handouts. If you haven't gotten one, the ushers can grab some for you. It's uh, to take notes. Just uh, uh, it's going through uh, actually Passion Month as opposed to Passion Week, so they can give you a uh, a little handout there so it's easier to to uh, take notes with but praise God it's good to be in the house of the Lord we know that today is a special day and we're excited to to be together we're excited to hear the little voices of little ones that's a blessing we're excited to hear the voices of other saints, like having our sister Frances and others here with us, boy, we rejoice in that. God is so good, but today is a day of celebration, a joyful day. Um, I was reading uh, some commentaries in preparation, and uh, I was uh, looking online, and I saw this uh, uh, a little quote from a play, an Easter play. And I thought it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty moving. Uh, it was a, a six-year-old, and he was playing the angel. And he had been practicing his lines over and over, and he wanted to make sure he got these down. And he was nervous and fearful. And the play began, and he stepped in to do his part, and he started to read in Luke, chapter twenty-four. And he stood before the the church and said, why do you seek the living among the dead? 
He is not here. He's in prison. <laughs> Instead of he has risen. It said this six-year-old spent all this time working on his line and wanting to do everything just right. And in the final moment, everything kind of fell apart in his hands. Sometimes life can kind of seem like that for us. Today is a day of celebration, a day of rejoicing. But sometimes in the midst of that, we can have trials. We can have pain. We can have things that can embarrass us, can make us feel heavy-hearted and concerned. But today is a day that we celebrate the cure for terminal sin. That is true. That is a true statement. So how did this cure for sin happen? What was the ingredients that caused this to come to pass? We know that Jesus fulfilled many, many prophecies. He fulfilled every prophecy that was told about the Messiah. But there was three major things that needed to happen for this cure for terminal sin to come into play. Many of us know them like the back of our hand. Whether we believe them is a different story. But we know the first to be the virgin birth. We know that the word of God says, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. We know this is in, 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 in Isaiah, speaking of the prophecy of the virgin birth of the Messiah. So we look at our checklist. We check that off the list. We see the second portion that must be completed. And the word of God says that the perfect lamb without spot or blemish must be sacrificed. See, in the Old Testament, what they would do is they would take a lamb as a covering for sin. They would take a lamb that is without spot or blemish, meaning it was perfect from birth. Without spot, meaning it was born in perfect condition. Without blemish means it didn't have any thing that happened in this life to injure it in any way. So this lamb was perfect. Well, the word perfect means something different in the Bible. Just like the word good. When we look at the word good, we think, uh, how many people you know that you would ask the question, are you a good person? What would be the normal response to that? Eh, depending on who you ask. What if we asked your family? Are you a good person? See, those are the ones. It, it gets worse. What if we ask your young children? <laughs> then you get down to the, right now, Sunday school teachers are hearing things downstairs. They're knowing, they're knowing the inside and outside of what's going on in your home. <laughs> I, I remember that because it used to happen to us with our little ones. We would always find out all kind of interesting details. But... But the word perfect in this meaning is without sin. That's what the Bible considers good. So when the question is asked, are you good enough to make it to heaven? The word good means perfect, means without sin. That's why we know that the law of the Old Testament just is a mirror to show us that we cannot be perfect, that we all fall short of the glory of God. So this lamb that was sacrificed was a symbol. It was a sign, a forerunner of the things to come, which is the Messiah. It was pointing to Jesus Christ. It was pointing to the death on the cross that he paid with his blood. See, he was perfect. He was sinless, but he died for you and I. 
He died for our sin. So this perfect lamb, who was Jesus, had to die in our place. This was the only way that our debt could ever be paid. And we say, well, I don't have a debt. I don't owe anybody anything. I've got savings even. <laughs> a debt is something that we were born with. A debt, as far as the word of God is, is a payment or a bill, a balance due. The word of God says the wages of sin, meaning the debt or the payment due for sin is death. That's non-negotiable. Well, I don't believe that. Well, what about gravity? Do you believe in gravity? I don't believe gravity. Well, if you got on the roof and jumped off, would it matter if you believed in gravity or not? Not until you hit the ground. <laughs> See, there is truths that are unchanging. The Word of God gives us these simple truths. See, us coming here today is just an opportunity to hear the truth of the gospel. The reason that we're here today is to understand what has been done for us. If you come in saying, I already knew that. That's old news. I've been going to church for a long time. Has it changed your life? Are you different because of the knowledge that you've received? Because if you aren't different, then you don't believe it or you don't understand it. Because you can't have a truth given to you and not respond to it. Say, oh, yeah, I know that's true, but. And we'll give ourselves an excuse. I know that's true, but this circumstance. I know what the Bible says in that area, but. See, it's always easy to give ourselves excuses. But the perfect law of the word of God is only covered by grace. See, Jesus, he poured his blood out on the cross to offer us a free, a payment for our sin. And we either have the opportunity to receive it or to walk away from it. And it's as simple as that. So in today, as a day of celebration, we celebrate the third part. Because first, you must have the virgin birth. Second, you must have the payment, the sacrifice for sin, which is Jesus, and he died on the cross. But the third portion, if it's not in place, then the other two don't matter. There must be a resurrection. He must rise from the dead. Unless this is in place, the other two things were done for no reason. See, we celebrate Christmas and we rejoice in the virgin birth, which is truly a miracle and it is deserving of celebration. But it was all done for today. It was all done. Jesus was born to die. And that's hard to hear sometimes. But that's the truth. So there must be a risen Savior. We know that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Word of God says in verse 55, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? See, we know that Jesus overcame death. He overcame death because he rose from the grave. See, all these things were put in place long before they happened. Nothing was done by surprise everything was prophesied about even going through like i mentioned before in isaiah 53 as was shared this morning he he was he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities but we have been healed by his stripes we have been healed see many will take that verse that salvation verse and say 
by his stripes, we can be healed of anything. But that's taking it out of context. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about being healed of our sin. I'm not saying God can't heal. Of course he can heal. He can do all things. He's God. But when we see a, a scripture, we must read it in its context. So if we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're just going to go over a couple of scriptures just to give us a little clarity. And it says in First Corinthians, excuse First Corinthians chapter fifteen, and we'll start in verse twenty. It says, "But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep." For since by man, and we know that this was even read this morning, and as a confirmation, we're reading it again tonight, uh, today. It says, for since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. See, the price was paid by Jesus. This resurrection was the completed work. See, when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He paid the debt, and he rose from the grave. So this is showing that we have been given a gift. It's understanding truly what that gift is. If we don't see it for its greatness, it just doesn't seem to mean anything to us. If we don't truly understand what's been given. You know, on, on, on Friday, we went through... Uh, and Brother Regis shared on what it entailed, the cross, on what Jesus went through, on what was suffered in our behalf, and on how he surrendered himself for you and I. This gift was given to us. If you are given a gift, doesn't it make sense to find out what it was? Doesn't it make sense to inquire what that gift is and understand it? But so many will hear about this gift and say, yeah, I know. And take it as nothing. But then the first thing that comes up, and it becomes the easiest thing to blame God. The first trial that comes in our direction we say god why are you doing this when it's our opportunity to press into god to seek his face to ask him for guidance in the midst of our trial at those points we may not have time for him but then when something bad happens the world is first to blame god why does god let this happen what we don't understand when we start thinking that way, and that's the thought of the world. The world says, why does a good God let that happen? Why would a good God allow bad things to happen? See, the fact that everyone is leaving out is that we are living in a fallen world. We are living in a fallen world, and we have a freedom to choose. You are here by choice this morning. You might be regretting that choice by now, but you're here by your own choosing. Nobody forced you. The ones that were forced are downstairs in class. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> but they're the ones having a blast too, so don't worry about it. They're having a great time. But we have a free will. If someone were to command you to love them, how much weight could you put in that? You, 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 had to, you had to force them to love you. And what happens when you walk away from them? You can't trust in something that is, that's, that's called a robot. 
You program it to love you. See, that's not the God we serve. He gives us the freedom, the will to choose whether we want to love him or we want to love ourselves more. Whether we want to love our situations or our circumstances or the things of this world over him. The problem is when we choose to love something else over God, then we must suffer the consequence that comes with it. See, we can't have everything our way. I want to serve God when I feel like it, when things are tough, when I want to cry out, God, help me in this circumstance. But as soon as it's fixed, then I'm good again. We can't serve God in that manner. That, that, that's just infancy. That's just immaturity. So if we're looking at just the day we say resurrection day, we rejoice, we're excited, we're all happy because God is so good. We've come to church and now we're saying, let's get out of here and go barbecue because God is good. But what is our life going forward from this point? That's the important question. If we know him as our Lord and Savior, how is that affecting our life? I'm a Christian. You know, you ask that question of many people. I, I remember in the workplace that you, people start finding out that you're a Christian and you start talking to them. All of a sudden, everybody comes out of the woodwork. They're Christians. Like, wow, I didn't know that you were a believer. By the language and the filthy jokes, I just figured you weren't. You know, depending on who you're around, it just seems like when it's when it's, when it's convenient, but if other people are around, then they don't want to be Christian. See, but being a Christian has a cost. And so many do not want to pay that cost. But it's not negotiable. It's a yes or no answer. So what does that consist of? 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll start in verse 3. The Word of God says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Praise God. Praise God. What a beautiful gift. This is the true word of God. But we can't stop reading at that verse. Because verse 5 says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, there's God's part and there's our part. God's part is everything. But we still play a part. We still have a role to play. When we look at Peter, and that's who wrote this, Peter began sharing the gospel as Brother Daniel shared this morning, kind of from an unusual place. We see Peter in so many different lights. We see Peter as kind of a bull in the china shop. We see Peter stand up with his chest puffed out. Maybe all of them will deny you, but never, not me. I'll die for you. Jesus is trying to warn him, saying, before the end of this night, you're going to deny me three times. But Peter said, no, not me. Then everybody else at the same time. Well, not us either. <laughs> everybody jumped right in. But when Peter came to an understanding, a true revelation of who Jesus was, his life was changed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. And this is the first time that Peter shares the word of God in Acts chapter 2. It says that after the Holy Spirit had come, it said that, that Peter stood up. He had boldness. He stood up and he raised his voice. 
And he shared the truth of what was going on, how they were speaking in tongues. He says in verse 14 of chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and heed my words, for, there are, for they are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. He's speaking about their speaking in tongues because they first thought these guys must be drunk. They're just speaking these unusual languages and gibberish. But he pointed to the word of God. He gave them understanding of what was going on, what was happening right before their eyes. And then in verse 22, it says, again, he says, men of Israel, hear these words. He's trying to shake them, to wake them up. You know, we need to be shaken sometimes. Sometimes we get so blinded in the midst of our everyday life that all we can focus on is what's right in front of our eyes. And we continue in it, whether it's work, whether it's kids, whether it's family, whether whatever it is, we're constantly going forward and all we're seeing is this and we're missing the big picture until what happens? Everything hits the fan. All of a sudden a problem hits us that we were not ready for. I went recently and I thank the church so much for their prayers and for the praying for my brother and, and his wife, their family. And um, I had to, uh, to travel to go see him. Uh, he was on a ventilator and wasn't doing well at all. And it went from one day to the next. That's not something you prepare for. That's not something that you think about. But when that happens, everything else means nothing. He wasn't thinking about, oh, but this week I'm supposed to do this or I'm supposed to go there. He was just trying to get air. His eyes rolling back in his head, just trying to keep his heart beating even. It's a fearful thing in that circumstance. But it changes in a moment's notice. And I say, we don't know what God has. We don't know what lies before us. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But when it does happen, that's when we react. I know that, um, and I'll share this with you. Uh, I don't mean to take it out of context, but as a as a praise report, uh, the, he's out of ICU, he's off the ventilator, he's doing better. Uh, so I know so many of you were praying, and I'm so thankful for that. Uh, his wife, who was really given a bad report from the doctors on the, on the cancer that she's been fighting and the surgeries that she's had to go through and the limited time that they were trying to give her as far as uh, lifespan, and God has shown differently. They say everything is shrinking, the cancer is going away. God is in control of all things. See, we don't, know, we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but as we seek his face, we know we serve a good God who goes before us. That's not always the circumstance. Please don't get me wrong. God's will will be done no matter what it is. See, each one of us has an appointed day, and we don't know what that will bring. We can be healed and, and, and feel like a million bucks and walk across the street and get hit by a bus. Well, today was the day the Lord was going to take us home. If he's going to take us home, that day is the day. But we must be ready. We must understand what it entails to be ready. So as Peter is trying to share truth, he gets the attention in verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man arrested, <clears throat> excuse me, attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. See, 
Peter even shares the specifics. He says that this was a determined purpose by the foreknowledge of God. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't, oh no, they came and took Jesus away. We even heard that on, on, on Friday on how they came to the garden to take him on how they were asking for Jesus of Nazareth and he said, I am he. And we know it to be anywhere from either 600 to 1600 troops that said, step back right to their face. They went down by his word. He said, I am, meaning I am God. That's the great I am. He said, I am, I am he. And they went down. <laughs> Who was in charge? Who's always in charge? See, there is never a circumstance or a situation that is outside of his ability. So we can always run to him. But he's sharing the truth of what had gone on, that all this was God's plan. He's telling these people of, of, in Israel, this is all God's plan. It says, and you have your lawless hands that have crucified and put him to death, whom God raised up, having loosened the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. See, death, where is your sting, means death had no power over Jesus. Death had no power over him any longer. And then he, and then he reads the Old, the Old Testament quote. But when we jump forward to, to verse 29, it says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you. See, he's still talking to them. He's saying, pay attention to what I'm saying to you. What I'm saying has meaning. I'm trying to give you understanding. See, that was him before. Now he's trying to pour understanding into them. He said, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and the tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. See, that's the bloodline of Jesus. He's saying that through David, this bloodline, that Jesus would come. Verse 31. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, and that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Again, he's explaining the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit moving in the midst. It says, for David did not ascend into heaven, but he said to himself, the Lord has said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemy your footstool. Therefore, we always know what's there for. What we just read, that's why it's there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He has made him both Lord and Christ. See, he gave him authority, and he made him the Messiah, the Savior. So as they heard this truth, see, all these Old Testament sayings were what they knew already. So he was giving them understanding of what the Old Testament was saying, and it says, and when they heard this, verse 37, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? How do we respond to this? They were cut to the heart. They understood the truth of the gospel. They understood Jesus was the Messiah. Do we understand that this morning? Do we understand that Jesus was the Christ? Throughout the gospel, we, we see the confirmation, even to the triumphant entry, how it was given the exact date, as we learned on Palm Sunday, how everything came into play perfectly. There's no arguing these things. It is history that we're talking about. We're not just talking about an opinion. Oh, that's what you think. Oh, that's what your opinion of what the Bible says. No, this is specific truths 
of history that we can find this even outside the Bible. It says, what shall we do? That means we have a part to do something. That means we have something that we're accountable to do. And Peter sums it up in one word. Verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent. Repent. What does repent? Repent means to change. Repent, the specific means 180 degree turn. It means I'm going this way away from Jesus. It means turn around and go towards Jesus. It means my first thought and concern is myself and I'm going in the direction that I want to go. And it means turn around and go the direction that Jesus wants you to go. Because he knows better anyway. He desires good for your life. He's going to direct you in the right direction. We have limited vision. He sees all things. So it says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord your God will call. It says, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. See, he told them. And he sat down, and he went through and gave them understanding that they needed Jesus. They needed to be changed. They needed to understand that they were to be a part, to be saved, to be separate from this perverse generation. Do we live in a perverse generation? Heaven forbid you watch the news. And you know what's so stressful and worrisome about the news? Before, you just had to worry about what happened around you. Before, you had concerns about your family. You had concerns about your city or your area. Now you're looking at people, children in subways with bombs going off on the other side of the world. That stresses us out. We're seeing people suffer and die all over the world. We can look on our phone and see in this area robberies and, and carjackings and shootings and everything else all around us. On how evil things have gotten. And now all of those things are all around us. And that's just the enemy continually trying to drag us down. But we serve a God who's bigger than these things. But we live in the midst of a dark world. We have to understand that we live in a perverse generation. We can't just think everything is fine. Everything's okay. We know young people that we've lost because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You could be driving down the freeway. That happened in the last day or two. People are getting shot for driving on the freeway. We don't know what tomorrow brings. But we know we live in a perverse generation. We know we have a God who's given us a gift by grace to receive eternal life, to guide and go before us by his Holy Spirit. But we must choose to receive that gift. There's three, there's three things in the next few verses that give us direction and insight on how we can serve God, on how we can be strengthened. Because it says in verse 41, verse 40 says, to be saved from this perverse generation, verse 41 says, then those who gladly received his word, praise God, those who gladly received the word were baptized and were added to them. Praise God. It says, and they continued steadfastly. Okay, and this is the beginning of those three steps. First of all, continuing. Don't give up. Make a decision and walk in it. Continue steadfastly. To continue steadfastly. It means that we are we are are set upon it. 
We are to continue. Stead, steadfast means firmly fixed in place, immovable, not subject to change. That's steadfastness. So continue steadfastly in what? Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, which is the word of God is understanding and knowing the Word of God. Continue in reading the Word of God. Continue in being in the house of God because the second says that to continue steadfastly in fellowship and breaking of bread. That means being together. That's something that we hadn't been able to do for a long period of time. And people think, well, there was a safety issue. I agree, there was. We actually shut the doors of the church, something that we thought we would never do. But we have to weigh out what is truly the importance here. Because now they're looking at the effects on our children, on being separated. The effects mentally on so many people for being isolated. See, when we're alone is when the enemy attacks. When we're on our own is when the enemy wants to come against us. When we're away from fellowship, when we're away from one another, we don't have that support of one another. We need to be there for one another. We're a family, the family of God. We need each other. We can't, we can't do it on our own. We might feel, well, it's, it's safer this way. At what cost? At what cost? We serve a big God. Do we believe that God is going to convict us? Oh, God is going to cause us to be condemned and, 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 and get uh, deathly ill because we came to the house of God? Th that doesn't make sense. We can be mindful. We can be smart. If we feel more comfortable with a mask, no one is ever uh, against those things. We've had the leaders praying for people with masks because we wanted people to feel comfortable coming to the altar. But we have to understand we need each other. We need to fellowship. We need to, it says the breaking of bread, even referring as a reference to communion. Communion is remembering what was done on Friday. The body that was broken, the blood that was shed. But it says steadfast, continuing steadfast, the apostles' doctrine in fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayer. So if we can keep our mind and heart on those things, God will strengthen us. He will help us. He will guide us. These are, are truly keys to become stronger in Christ. And it says that in that day, over 3,000 were added to the church. 3,000 that were brought in. It says all these things were done. God desires to draw us close to him. God has given us this day to look up. See, it's just a simple conversation. The truth is the truth. We have it set before us, and now we're accountable with what we do with it. Okay, this is the truth that the speed limit is 45 miles an hour. You can do what you want with that. I choose to do 80 on the other side of the street in the wrong direction. Guess what? You're going to have a problem. It won't take too long either. Yeah, but I have the free will. You sure do, and you will suffer the consequence. But you can't drive on the other side of the street at 80 miles an hour and blame God. You can't say, I'm not choosing you, Lord. I don't want anything to do with you. I want my free will to do whatever I want, but I'm going to blame you if things don't go my way. See, you're given the truth. You have a choice. There is only two. We choose him or we walk away from him. Those are the opportunities. Well, that sounds harsh. That's not a loving God. But see, God loved us so much that he made a way, that he sent his son, his only begotten son, from heaven, the highest place we could ever imagine, to the lowest place on this earth, to die on a cross. To be beaten and disfigured. It says that he was even hardly, didn't even hardly look like a man because of all that he suffered. But he was disfigured to that point. And he suffered all that for you and I and died on a cross. So that we would have the opportunity to receive a free gift 
of grace. Does that sound like a, an angry, upset God? That is a loving God who's given us every opportunity. That's just like the, the story of the, of the guy driving down the freeway and, and finds that it's closed and he sees all these signs and he's driving through roadblocks and he's paying no attention to it. It says bridge out. He's still going. He doesn't care. He runs through another sign. Boards are flying everywhere. And he finally hits the end of the bridge and launches off. And then he blames God for that. Well, every single sign was there saying stop, turn around, don't go forward. This morning you're hearing signs. This morning, you're seeing flashing lights. What are you going to do with it? You might think, wow, this is a wonderful Easter morning. God has called me to share truth. I can't stand here before you and not share the truth of what the gospel says. What, what does the word of God say in Revelations? In Revelations chapter 20, verse 10, and we can look up on the board. The word of God says, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's what the scripture says. Yeah, well, that's talking about that's talking about the devil and the and, and the beast and the false prophet. That's not talking about you and I. But what what does it say as we continue to read the white throne judgment in verse eleven? It says, "Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it." from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the book. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and, the de and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. It says, then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Black and white. Happy Easter. That's truth. That's truth. I, I, I love my family. I'm not going to stand before my family and the family of God and my friends and not give you the full truth of what the Word of God says. We have that understanding, but we have the freedom to make a decision with whatever we want to do with it. That's the truth of the gospel. Jesus gave us a way. And all he asks for us is to receive it. That's our job. That's our part. By grace, freely receive it and walk in it. And what does that do for us? Why, why would I ever surrender my free will for that? Because that's the choice. And the free will we receive is eternal life. We serve a God who's good. We serve a God who desires good for our life. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. The payment of sin, what each and every one of us owe, no matter who you are, what you owe for your sin is death. But the second half of that verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. That's what's been given to us. Will you receive that truth today? Do you understand what's being offered? Because we're accountable for it. You can't unknow it. We can't stand before a God 
who the word of God says, I know your thoughts before you think them, and we can't stand before God and say, I didn't know. We know. We're accountable for what we know. Now the question is, what will you do with it? Today is a special day. Today is a joyful day. But unless we have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, unless our name is written in the Lamb's book of life, we heard, we just read. And that's not opinion. That's the truth of the word. Let's go back to 1 Peter and we'll be closing with this. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll pick up in verse 13. It says, therefore, gird up your loins, the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, before you knew, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Praise God. Praise God. You know that the apostles, they shared with Jesus in John chapter 16 that they understood, that they finally got it. In John chapter 16, verse 25, it says, These things I have spoken to you in a figurative language, but this but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in a figurative language, meaning in Proverbs. He says, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Verse 26. And in that day you will ask in my name and I will do, excuse me, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father, and I have come into the world. Again, I leave the world, and I go to the Father. Verse 29. And the disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. And Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Now you get an understanding? You know how many times Jesus had already gone through in teaching the disciples, and they're finally going, now you said it clearly. Now we're getting an understanding. And then Jesus told them, do you now believe? Verse 32, indeed this hour is coming, yes, and now has come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, and yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. See, he said, now you understand. Now you're going to go forward, but it's not going to be easy. There's a lot before you. He knew what stood before them. They were going to watch him be beaten. They were going to watch him to be beaten with a cat of nine tails. They were going to watch his back be torn to shreds. They were going to see him beaten beyond recognition and see him nailed, crucified, and die on a cross. He knew what stood before them. But even as his word says, he would never leave us nor forsake us. We serve a God who loves us, who surrendered everything for us. And this morning, as we hear these words of truth, I ask you again in the love of Christ, what will you do with God's Son? Will it cause your life to change? Or will it just be something that you speak? Because if we truly believe the truth of the Word of God, it has to change us. It causes our hearts to change. It causes our actions to change. Every single person who's received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you hear story after story on how the grass is greener, 
the sky is blue or everything just looks so different. You don't understand. It was just I, I, from one day to the next, my life had changed. Me personally, I was a big crybaby, scared to death of my own shadow. My wife thought she had married somebody that was just losing their mind and insane, going to put me in a mental hospital because all I wanted to do was lay in bed and cry. But God was using that to call me. And from that day forward, when my, when my eyes were open, my, my, my eyes were open to the truth of the gospel, the joy that it gives me to know that we serve a big God. And then when we see all that he is constantly doing in the lives of his people, we rejoice in it. So this morning, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we're going to pray. I'm going to call the, the worship team forward. And we're going to pray and we're going to open the altar. And as we open the altar, I want to ask you, if you never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if your name has never been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, this morning you have an opportunity to do that. It's as simple as asking Jesus into your heart. See, this is all he asks from us, and he will go before us. So let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true. Father, this is a day that we celebrate and rejoice in the beautiful gift you have given us, Lord. But Father, where we fall short, Lord, we pray you forgive us, Lord. Father, where you have called us to draw close to you, where you desire to use us, Lord. Father, help us to see clearly and to walk in what you've called us to do. Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as the Lord and Savior, Father, someone that has never received you into their heart, Father, you draw them to this altar, Lord. Father, you move in the hearts of those downstairs, Lord. Strengthen and bless those who need a touch from you in their physical bodies, Lord. Father, touch those who are at home, online, that don't know you, Lord. Cause them to look up, Lord. This is a day that we rejoice and celebrate for what you have done. But, Father, help us in obedience, Father, to walk with you, Lord. Bless your people in a mighty way. We thank you for this time of gathering, and we ask that you just minister to all those who desire a touch from you. Have your way in this place, Lord. We thank you, and we ask again by your Holy Spirit, Move in the hearts who need a touch from you. We thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. The altar is open. If anyone desires prayer, you come. I'm going to call the leaders forward, and they'll be standing here, and you can come forward, and, and you don't have to say what you want to pray about, or, or if you want to receive Jesus, you can just ask that person that you'd like to receive the Lord. But I'm going to call the leaders forward at this time. The altar is open. You come.
Before we close in prayer, I just want to share with each and every one of you that Jesus loves you. He loves you tremendously. 
He loves you to the point that he shed his blood for you. And have joy even in that. Understand that we serve a loving and a merciful God. And he continues to go before us. Don't be distracted by the world that we live in, by the things that are around about us. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will continue to be faithful and to go before his people. Trust in him. Have joy. Praise God. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us this day of, of rejoicing in the risen Savior. Father, this day of examining your word and just understanding, Father, that, Father, you have a desire to, to move in our lives, Lord. So, Father, this day, Father, move in our hearts, Lord. Continue to strengthen us. Father, help us to be filled with your peace even this day, knowing that you go before us in all things. We rejoice in you this day, Lord. We ask that you would continue to bless our time together. Father, even as we may meet with family and friends uh, later, Lord, that you would just help us to shine for you, Lord, that, that we would be lights in the midst of this dark world. And just, Father, use us to, to share even the truth of the gospel with our unsafe family members. We thank you for this time you've given us. We thank you for this morning service, for being together even now. And we ask you to even bless our fellowship and, and our time together today. We just give you all thanks and all praise and all you're doing and even all you're going to do even in this blessed day. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Love one another, God people. We've got some goodies downstairs. There's also a, a bench and a background seating. Those who desire to take pictures with your family, it's a... A perfect opportunity to be together. Praise God.